Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Plymouth United Church. So glad that you have decided to join us this Sunday morning. Let's take a moment to co-create this sacred space together and to center ourselves. Take a deep breath. Find yourself in your body. Do you have any aches and pains? Do you have any places that are jubilant in your body? Love on yourself in all of your physicalness and find the parts of you that are strong so that they can be a foundation for the parts of you that are feeling weak, that are feeling challenged, that are struggling. And as you get in touch with the physical aspect of yourself, move your consciousness to the intellectual aspect of yourself, the thinking part of yourself. How is your brain? What are you thinking? And what are you glad that you're thinking? And what do you wish you could let go of? And can that part of your thinking, which you are grateful for, that you're excited about, be a foundation for the parts of your thinking that you're struggling with to lean on? And can you integrate the physical aspect of yourself with the thinking aspect of yourself, bringing yourself, weaving yourself together like a fabric is woven together. And as you do this weaving process, take the thread of your emotions and begin weaving that in as well and find the aspects of your emotions where you are feeling strong. And where in your emotional self are you struggling? Do you feel a little broken? Where are you jubilant? And overlay that which is struggling, feeling broken onto that which is jubilant and strong. And then weave that into your body, into your intellect. As you come into the fullness of your being, as you intentionally are in this sacred space, and weave in the thread of your spirit of your soul. Find the aspects of your soul which are jubilant, which are strong. And find the aspects of your spirit which are struggling, which maybe are broken or hurt. And as you weave yourself fully together in a whole kind of way, Allow the strength in your spirit to be a support for the weakness of your spirit, for the tiredness, for the weariness. Because we're all constructed of all these parts all at the same time, sometimes one direction more than another, no doubt. But we do have strength even when we have weakness, and we do have weakness even when we have strength. And as we take these threads together and weave them amongst each other, creating a stronger fabric than if all those threads were just lying separately, we also raise our consciousness to everyone else who's co-creating this sacred space. And we weave an even larger fabric, a stronger one, creating a bond with this moment, with this day, and with each other as we co-create this sacred moment and bring our full selves to this time and to this place together. And now I invite you to join us as we sing together.
please join me in our responsive call to worship. We rejoice in the divine as we make our way through this Lenten journey. In the wilderness, our hunger is filled with holy hope. In the desert, our thirst is quenched from the stream of God's presence. On the road to Jerusalem, our weariness is transformed into strength by grace. We each walk our own journey as led by spirit. We all walk together as the body of Christ in the world. And now it's time with the children. Hey, kids, come on close and gather around me. You know, so to speak. Let's pretend we're gathered around one another anyway. I want to ask you a question. Do you know what a labyrinth is? I bet a whole bunch of you do. Well, I've got an example of some labyrinths. These are smaller labyrinths. Most labyrinths are on the ground and we walk them. But these are called finger labyrinths and we have them in the church. And we use them throughout the church service. Anybody is able to pick them up when we have in-person service. And you follow the line and it goes through all these twists and turns and it goes to the center. Then you follow it back out again. So this is an example of one kind of labyrinth. Here's an example of another kind of labyrinth. And then I've got one that's even smaller than that. And it's cute. It's a little dolphin. And here you've got one entry point in the mouth of the dolphin. Right here. And you follow it along. And it leads you through all the uh, outside and then the twists and the turns and then it leads you back out again. And this is another kind of a finger labyrinth. These are really cool and we like to use them a lot. The one that we have outside is of course much, much bigger and lots of people can be walking on it at the same time. We're going to have, um, we have labyrinth walks about four times a, a year. We all get together and we meditate and walk the labyrinth most of the time silently, but the labyrinth is open any time that you want to walk it, um, and there's lots of different ways to do it. Now, one of the cool things about a labyrinth is that it has a beginning and a middle and an end, and you can't get lost. It leads you to the center and then leads you out of the center. Have you ever played with a maze? A maze is not like that. It, a maze it has lots of dead ends and you can get stuck and then you got to go all the way back and try to find your way and you can get lost and it's just, it's a fun game, but it's not how I want to live life. I'd rather live life like a labyrinth and that's what we're going to talk today about um, in our readings and in my reflection. So I hope that you sometimes come and visit our labyrinth here at the church and that you can walk it in whatever way that you want to, and that you enjoy it being outside, and sometimes even come to our events where we get to walk it all together. Would you join your hearts with mine in prayer? Holy love, we thank you for this life, and that it is a life where we don't have to get lost. We can follow the path that is our life, and when it twists and turns, we can just say that's okay and twist and turn with it. Help us to be patient with all of the ways that life is and help us to not get discouraged or confused when we have a turn that we have to make. Help us to remember that the life that we lead is like a labyrinth and not be afraid that we're at a dead end because life is not like a maze. It is more like a labyrinth. We love you, God. And we know that you love us. And all God's children said, Amen. Our biblical witness this morning is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 16 through 20. Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee. He saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. They were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed Jesus. When he'd gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat, mending their nets. And immediately Jesus called to them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after Jesus to follow him. Our contemporary witness this morning uh, is an excerpt from a book by Rachel Held Evans. The book is entitled Searching for Sunday, and she says as follows, The difference between a labyrinth and a maze is that a labyrinth has no dead end. 
the famed 11th Circuit Labyrinth inlaid in the floor of Chartres Cathedral in France has just one path, which takes the pilgrim in and out of four quadrants in a spiraling motion through dozens of left and right turns before reaching its rosette center. Such a pattern invites meditation, the mystics say, and reminds the pilgrim the journey of faith is rarely a straightforward one. It has become cliché to talk about faith as a journey, and yet the metaphor holds. Scripture doesn't speak of people who found God. Scripture speaks of people who walked with God. This is a keep moving, one foot in front of the other. Who knows what's next deal? And you never exactly arrive. I don't know if the path's all drawn out ahead of time or if it corkscrews with each step like in Alice's Wonderland or if, as some like to say, we make the road by walking. But I believe the journey is more labyrinth than maze. No step taken in faith is wasted, not by a God who makes all things new. Today I want to talk to you about everyday faith. Not in the way that it's something we take for granted or is mundane, but faith as a way of life, faith that we integrate into our decisions simply because it's how we choose to live. All too often, religion cultivates fear as a way of controlling behavior, fear of eternal torment, fear of a sinful life that displeases God, and even fear of being tainted by the sins of others which might rub off on us unawares, ushering us into an unintentional eternal torment. This is what I believe religious wars and hate is all about. This kind of fear. I fear that the believer will end up being on the wrong end of the stick morally and spiritually, resulting in their utter eternal demise. In this thinking, life and spirituality is a maze. One wrong turn and you're at a dead end, lost and doomed no matter how hard you try. Rachel Held Evans, the writer of our contemporary witness, was a believer who took lots of twists and turns in her faith. As she questioned and held up her faith to her doubt, she saw her path as a labyrinth rather than as a maze. A labyrinth is a single path that feels like many paths. It has one destination, but many stops and pauses. It's nonlinear, and it's inefficient. As you walk it, you pass by where you walked before, but you aren't in the same place, and your perspective isn't the same. This is what everyday faith is like. It changes as we go. Sometimes when we look back, it might seem like we haven't gone anywhere, but what's happened is that we've taken a turn. We've been redirected. Still, even though it seems sideways or backward, we're moving forward. Jesus called some people to follow him. We have one example in the story uh, called Mark. Here, Jesus actively invites people to leave behind what they're doing to share his life with him. They create a kind of intentional community. It isn't a utopian experience, and thank goodness for that. It would be too high of a mark to achieve. Instead, they simply share their days, struggles and joys alike. They take risks, challenge each other, comfort each other. They get hungry together. They cry and laugh, mourn and rejoice. It's not a perfect community. It's not a perfect life. But we watch them go through these things together every day. It's rare when we can leave behind everything to follow a path like that. So even though their lives weren't perfect, what the writer describes is still somewhat unattainable. For us, there are jobs to go to, kids to feed, cars to fix, everyday life. Can our faith really be an everyday faith? I think it can. I know that I have the luxury of living my faith in a dedicated way. I get to pastor this amazing church and talk about God with y'all. But this wasn't always the case. The benefit of starting my vocation as a pastor in midlife is that 
Although I had lots of experiences at other jobs before this. I had to squeeze God into my life at times. I'd forget about prayer. You know, the, the formal kind where you close your eyes and you think really hard about what to say. I didn't always see the sacrality in nature and in each moment. Not that I didn't believe in it. I always believed in it. I just forget to look. Well, sometimes even now I forget to look. The difference is that now I don't feel as guilty about it. Everyday faith isn't about being so attentive to God that nothing else gets in. For me, it's about living life in a way that I'm open to being shaped by moments where the sacred is revealed. That almost sounds more religious than I mean. Everyday faith means being open in my spirit. Well, in all of myself. But not rigidly so. This whole idea about life being like a labyrinth walk suggests that we ease up on our demands to ourselves about how we're going to shape God into our life. We live life with the assumption that God is our companion and, and that together we do shape it. And we shape it with one another. You and me. Us. Last week, our biblical witness was from the letter of Paul to the Colossians. In that letter, Paul wrote, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. This is one of my favorite verses about everyday faith. It brings me back to the Gospels where we read those stories of Jesus and his friends going through their days together. The writer really wants us to understand the bonding that they had. And even though that experience for them was probably not like it was depicted in Godspell or Jesus Christ Superstar or even the Bible itself, he did have intentional followers who adapted their lives by his teachings. Jesus didn't lead through fear. He did mention consequences, and he even used symbolic language about consequences which were pretty intense and which sometimes are misconstrued as being literal. But when you read the stories about Jesus and the way the writers share their understanding of him and his faith leadership, he was against strong-arming people to prove his point, to get his way, to have them believe what he believed. He was intense and demanding. There's no doubt about it. But he knew he was intense and demanding. He knew his ideals were higher than anyone could reach. And he knew that life isn't lived in a straight line. It bends and turns. It goes all over. It's why he spoke in so many parables. What he was getting at in his teachings, it was too massive. There were too many folds. He had to use parables. All that massiveness and all those folds might be intimidating to us, except that his parables were so very often about everyday life. The kingdom of God, he said, is like a mustard seed. It's like a farmer. It's like a woman baking bread. It's like a treasure hunter, a merchant, a person who fishes. The kingdom of God is just like you every day. It's not about doing it all right and not making any mistakes. It's about following the path and trusting yourself, trusting God. We aren't in a maze. While a labyrinth path can be, well, highly inconvenient at times when you just want a linear way to get stuff done, it can also be what helps us slow down and experience life rather than trying to impose some kind of a rule over it. When you hear a beckoning to follow a faith path and you say yes, you're saying yes to being open, to being shaped, and to being adaptable. All the turns we make aren't evidence that we've done something wrong that we're correcting. It's just the shape of the path in that moment. We keep moving, one moment after another, every day. And with that, I leave you peace.
Please join your hearts with mine in prayer. Holy love, we thank you for this life and for the way that we take it step by step, turn by turn and moment by moment. Help us when things get strange, when they're inconvenient, when they twist and turn on us. Help us to remember that, that life is complex and that you are complex in all of your isness, in the way that you love, in, in the way that you companion us all. Help us to feel the strength of the twists and the turns as they support each other. And help us to yield to your teachings so that we're adaptable while at the same time leaning strongly on our core values and being guided by the moral compass that we have been shown through your grace and through your love. And help us to hear each other and the path that we all walk so that we can appreciate how you have created each of us in your image and created each of us to be community one with another. And because we choose to walk this path with each other in community, we lift our voices up together in these common words of prayer. Loving God, lead us beyond ourselves to care and protect, to nourish and shape, to challenge and energize both the life and the world you have given us. God of light and God of darkness, 
God of conscience, and God of courage, lead us through this time of spiritual confusion and public uncertainty. Lead us beyond fear, apathy, and defensiveness to new hope in you and to hearts full of faith. Give us the conscience it takes to comprehend what we're facing, to see what we're looking at, and to say what we see, so that others, hearing us, may also brave the pressure that comes with being out of public step. Give us the courage we need to confront those things that compromise our conscience or threaten our integrity. Give us, most of all, the courage to follow those before us who challenged wrong and changed it, whatever the cost, to themselves. Good morning, everyone. During this time when we are not gathering in person, we have created several opportunities for gathering together on Zoom. Sunday mornings at 10, before the service begins, we meet for a time of fellowship. On Wednesday evenings at 6.30, we have our book study group. And on Friday evenings at 7, Judy Walden hosts our small group discussion related to the current reflection topic. You can find the link to these in our Thursday's Thoughts newsletter or on our Facebook page. We do have an opportunity to meet in person. Weather permitting, we hold an outdoor afternoon service in the back field of the church. It begins at 1.30 p.m. and we ask you to please bring a chair. The bulletin is sent in an email Sunday morning. And if you would like to be on our email list for our newsletter and other mailings, please email Melanie at melaniec at plymouthunited.org. It's been quiet at the church this week. No additional damage has happened, thank goodness, and no additional work has been done. Crews are still busy doing demolitions in other places. We are enjoying this in-between time while we wait for a crew to become available. Currently, our systems upgrade campaign has reached a little over $13,000. Thank you to everyone who has given and is considering a gift. The money we collect will go toward whatever insurance doesn't cover and to repiping the church. If we collect enough, we can also upgrade our electrical system, which is also problematic. If you are able to participate in this campaign, please mark your gift, Systems Upgrade Campaign. The holidays are only weeks away. Palm Sunday is March 25th, and we will have a Good Friday service on Facebook April 2nd at 7 p.m. And then we celebrate Easter on Facebook April 4th. We hope that the weather holds so we can also celebrate both Palm Sunday and Easter together outside in the field. It's always good to see you, even when it's only eyes above the mask. We know many people have been coming to our online services that we have never met. We can't wait to be able to open the church to be able to meet you in person. If you are considering joining Plymouth, please contact Pastor Mac at pastor at PlymouthUnited.org. Each week, we collect two offerings. One is for the church, which goes into our general fund for the running of the church and our ministries. The second is the loose offering, which is sent to a designated charity, which changes each week. Our loose offering for today will go to Plant It Forward which is a Houston, Texas-based nonprofit organization with the mission to empower refugees to develop sustainable farming businesses that produce fresh, healthy food for our community. Each farm will have the potential to generate a fair wage for a family of four while providing premium brand sustainably grown produce to Houstonians. If you would like to give to our general fund or to the loose offering or both, you can use bill pay from your bank, send us a check, or use push pay according to the directions on your screen. As always, thank you for supporting Plymouth and the ministries of the Loose Offering. Introducing something new, a simpler way to give to Plymouth. Just text PUC Give to 77977 and you will receive a text back with a link to PushPay where you can complete your gift. 
once in PushPay, you can enter your amount and then designate your gift under the Fund drop-down, where you can choose from the options of General Fund for My Giving, Loose Offering for our weekly missions and outreach, Other, or our new campaign for Systems Upgrade. Choose to give one time or make it a recurring gift. Lastly, you can pay directly from your bank account or by card. And that's it! For a new super simple way to give the Plymouth, just text PUC Give to 77977. Please join me in our responsive offertory prayer, which was written by Reverend Joanna Harrater. God of the journey, we give these offerings in gratitude, rejoicing in the abundance of your gifts to us. We give these offerings in faith, trusting that you will provide for our needs. We give these offerings in hope, knowing you can use them to spread your love in this world. And with these offerings, we give ourselves. May we live with generous hearts with open hands. Amen. Be our song, no 
one stands alone, standing side by side. Draw the circle wide. Let the dreams we dream be larger than we've ever dreamed before. Let the dream. And now, my friends, it is time to move from this moment to whatever it is that you have next. Blessings to you. Blessings to you upon this day, on your next week, on the rest of the month and this holiday season. Go forth in the power that is everyday faith and in the expectation that all you have to do is be in the next moment with yourself, with God, and with each other. Go forth in peace and as peacemakers.